Uh, I know that you often hear people that speak at conferences say this, and you likely think it's just, you know, kind of a fake, phony thing, that behind the scenes there's all of this collaborating, uh, and there really isn't. I never, ever spoke to Sandy about what he was intending to speak on here at Midland Park, nor did I discuss with him what I was intending to speak on, but there are a lot of similarities and overlaps in terms of the material that uh, I intend to handle with what you've already heard. I don't know what you come to a conference expecting, uh, what type of ministry you like to hear. You know, there's some people that say they want to hear uh, expositional teaching. There's some people that say they want to hear a topical presentation. There's some people that say they just want practical instruction, nothing too deep and heavy. There's some people that say they want some doctrine, some meat that they can actually be challenged by. So I don't know what your expectations are, but I have been burdened a little bit over the last little while with the need for us to read the Bible the way it was written. We have at our convenience today what no generation before us has had, which is the ability to almost instantaneously search the Bible, whether it's with a Google search or with Bible software, and topical studies, which at one time involved tremendous digging into the Word of God to find various passages that dealt with the subject, can now be done almost instantaneously. What does the Bible say about marriage? And bam, you'll have 82 references that'll tell you everything the Bible says about marriage. Or what does the Bible say about sanctification? Or word studies, how many times is this word found? Or if you graduate to the next level, you find the Strong's number and you look up the Strong's number word and get the Greek word and how many times it's used. Bible study has become easier in many respects. But my specific burden for my ministry sessions at this conference is this. The New Testament, if we take it as it has been given to us, there's 27 books. The first five books are history books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. The last book is a prophecy, the revelation of Jesus Christ. In between those, we have 21 books that are letters. The Bible actually wasn't given to us as a glossary or an encyclopedia. It wasn't given to us as a, a systematic theology textbook. And I'm not despising those, those are good. But that's not how the Bible was given to us. And so the vast majority of teaching that we have in the New Testament is given to us in the form of letters. And every one of those letters has a unique set of circumstances attached to it. It's got a writer. It's got the original recipients. Most of them, it's fairly easy to see the purpose for which it was written. And as you understand the writer, the recipients, where it fits into the history that we have in the book of Acts, the topics that it takes up, you begin to understand the teaching that it contains. And then as you begin to understand the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians or the book of 1 Thessalonians, and you see how they fit together with the other letters, you see how that teaching comes together. Now, I can't tell you why God chose to reveal himself and his truth in this way. That's not my prerogative. I'm not sure it's terribly fruitful to argue or think about why. The fact is that he did. And so my burden is this. I think it's our responsibility, therefore, and we'll touch a little bit tomorrow on personal Bible study, but I think it's our responsibility to accept the Bible the way it's been given and to seek to learn from it. So what I would like to do is to take up likely one of the best known uh, letters in the New Testament, likely one that most believers are reasonably familiar with, and just talk a little bit about the truth contained in that letter. So before I start, this is more for the younger ones. The older ones, you'll know all this. But for the younger ones, close your Bibles. You always say open your Bibles. Close your Bibles. No cheating. Remember that little verse, thou God seest me. So if you're cheating, you're going to get caught. I'm going to speak to you about the book of Philippians. Before I start, I'm going to ask eight questions. And if you've got one of these little outlines, on the back, there's a blank page. So if you have a writing instrument, you ever notice that the fancy pens, they don't call them pens? Someone bought me a Mont Blanc pen. If you see my Mont Blanc pen and you think, man, he never ever can speak on financial stewardship, and covetousness because he carries a Mont Blanc pen. I'll tell you, somebody bought it for me. I never in my wildest dreams would spend the money that it takes to buy a Mont Blanc pen. But I dropped it and it broke and I went into the Mont Blanc store 
in Yorkdale Mall in Toronto and was absolutely floored at what they cost. And I had to spend an exorbitant amount of money to get it fixed. But what I noticed is they don't call them pens, they call them writing instruments. So if you have a writing instrument with you, you get the back of your form. I'm going to ask you some questions. Philippians is one of four books often referred to as the prison epistles. If you've never heard of that, then skip to question two. If you have heard of that, what are the other three? What are the other three books which, along with Philippians, are referred to as the prison epistles? I'll give you a hint. They're written by Paul, and they were written by Paul when he was in prison. Okay, question number two, an easy one. How many chapters... How many chapters are there in the letter to the Philippians? So if you know the answer, then you write it down. If you don't, cheat. Look at somebody beside you. Question three. I'll give you the answer to that one. There's four. Four chapters. Question three. What were Paul's main reasons for writing this letter to the Philippians? I don't expect you to know all of them, but do you know any of them? Because my hope is that by the end of these two days you will have gained at least this rudimentary level of knowledge that will whet your appetite to dig deeper into this letter and other letters, because you can take this approach to any of the letters that are in the New Testament. And then here's a good one that I was challenged on by a preacher probably about 10 or 15 years ago who took up uh, 1 Thessalonians, and he said this, can you quote from memory a verse from chapter 1? And he stumped me because I couldn't. First Thessalonians 1, I was stumped. I couldn't think of one. So can you quote from memory any verse from Philippians chapter 1? What about chapter 2? Chapter 3 and chapter 4. Memorization has become a bit of a, you know, a retro thing. Not too many memorize things anymore. You carry a smartphone. You can look up whatever you need. You don't need to commit it to memory. I would suggest it's very healthy to get the word of God into your mind and into your heart. The psalmist says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So it's a healthy thing. So one verse from each of those four chapters. And then finally, what are two or three of the main themes of the letter to the Philippians? Now, Brother Sandy took up 1 Thessalonians, and although he dealt with the very end of chapter 5, he gave us a quick overview of the five chapters and the main teaching of the epistle. So that's what I would like to try to get into your minds. And if you have a blank sheet, then pull that out tomorrow afternoon and see if you can fill it in. Okay, the letter to the Philippians. So let's open it and we will look at it together. I'll tell you my intention today is, the first message today is just a very quick introduction to the book. And then I want to spend my time going over the main themes in the epistle. So my intention today is, in this morning session, we'll look at a quick overview uh, of the book, the purpose, the reasons for which it was written. And I'm going to ask you to keep your Bible open because I really would like you to see from your Bible the things that I'm saying. And then we're going to look quickly this morning at two themes, the theme of unity, which is very prominent in the book, and secondly, the theme of joy and rejoicing, which is very prominent in the book. And it's interesting that Sandy's first verse was rejoice evermore. We'll see how that theme runs through this letter. This afternoon, Lord willing, we're going to look at the subject of the believer's mind. And that is another great theme in the letter to the Philippians, the mind, a healthy mind that we should try to cultivate as believers. And then, Lord willing, tomorrow afternoon, we will look at really the predominant theme in the book of Philippians is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps more than any other New Testament letter, it is saturated with truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. So those are the, the, the subjects we're going to take up. So we'll just read at the beginning, verse 1, chapter 1, the letter to the Philippians. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So very quickly an introduction, this letter was written by Paul. It was written to the Christians meeting in an assembly in Philippi. Now, Sandy mentioned that Thessalonica, the work began in what we now know of as Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, at the beginning of the chapter, Paul travels to this city of Thessalonica, and that is where the background to the assembly there, and hence the letter written to that assembly, is to be found. 
Well, if you just back up one chapter to chapter 16 in the book of Acts, you'll come to the origin of the Lord's work in the city of Philippi. And you remember that Paul and Silas came to Philippi, the gospel was preached, people were saved, a Philippian jailer, Lydia the seller of purple, the demon-possessed girl, and the work of God began in Philippi. If you read through the book of Acts, you come to chapter 28. At the end of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 28, Paul is in prison in Rome. And it is likely from that prison cell that Paul wrote these four letters that we refer to as the prison epistles. He wrote a letter to the assembly in Ephesus, a letter to the assembly in Colossae, a letter to the assembly in Philippi, and a personal letter to a man called Philemon. Those four grouped together are often referred to as the prison epistles. So this letter to the Christians in Philippi was written around historically the time at the very end of the book of Acts. Paul's in prison, he's writing back to them, and in terms of the reasons for writing the letter, we'll just quickly go through here and I'll show you, I think there's probably five reasons. It's different than some other letters in that there's no massive issue he's writing to correct. Read the letter to the Corinthians, especially the first letter, and there's things that were going on that he had to correct. So it's a very corrective letter. You read the letter to the Thessalonians, and the passage in chapter 4 that Sandy referred to was filling in knowledge that was lacking. It was actually explaining to them something that they didn't actually know yet. And he wanted to clarify truth concerning the rapture, the coming of the Lord Jesus. The letter to the Philippians is a letter that doesn't really have a lot of correction. It does exhort them to unity. Nor does it have any great correction of doctrinal error. But there's at least five reasons that he wrote to them. Number one is when you come to verse 12 of chapter 1, Paul says, I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul was writing to let them know that he was okay. News, of course, traveled differently back then than it does now. There was no social media. There was no mainstream media. But somehow news would have filtered back to these Christians in Philippi that Paul was in prison in Rome. And there were other people out preaching, some of them supporters of Paul, some of them detractors of Paul. And the Christians at Philippi were wondering, how is Paul? How's he doing? And so he writes this letter to tell them. And we'll look a little bit later at chapter 1. He says, I'm doing fine. I'm here, I'm in prison, and the gospel is prospering. Secondly, if we go a little further, we'll come to verse 1 of chapter 2. And the second reason why he writes this letter is to exhort them to unity. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So the second reason for writing this letter is to impress on them the importance of remaining unified. The third reason for writing the letter if we come down to chapter 2, verse 25, Paul says, I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. So the background to this is that this assembly in Philippi had sent a gift to Paul in Rome to help him. And the gift had been sent not through Truth and Tidings Trust, or through some uh, Interact e-transfer or electronic means. They didn't have that. So this man, Epaphroditus, had been given the gift, entrusted with it to transport it to Rome to give it to Paul, and he had done that. But while doing that and helping Paul in Rome, he became sick. And the Christians back in Philippi were very worried about Epaphroditus. And so the third reason for which Paul sends this letter, and he actually sends it back with Epaphroditus, carrying the letter back, is to reassure the Christians in Philippi that Epaphroditus had fulfilled his mission faithfully, had been a great help to Paul, and was recovered. He was healthy again. So that's reason number three. Reason number four for writing the letter is found in chapter 3 and verse 1. Uh, verse 2, actually. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. And if you read down to the end of chapter 3, he's warning them uh, in verse 18 about false teachers that would come in and cause problems in the assembly. So the fourth reason for which he was writing was to warn them against false teachers. And then the final reason 
maybe the main reason why he was writing is in chapter 4. He was writing to thank them for the gift that they had sent him. So in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord of chapter 4, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful but lacked opportunity. And he thanks them for the gift that he had sent them. So there's five reasons from the letter why this letter was written. But now, what are the major themes? Well, as I said in the 20 minutes, 25 minutes that I have left, I want to touch on just the first two. And then, Lord willing, this afternoon we'll talk for the entire message on the mind of the believer as we see it in these four chapters. And then tomorrow afternoon we'll speak about the Lord Jesus and how we see Him presented in these chapters. So look with me then, first of all, at the subject of unity. Often you'll hear people say that Philippians is the, the book that stresses to us the importance of, in the New Testament, of the truth from the Old Testament, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands the blessing. And that's very true. So how does Philippians do that? Well, there's basically three passages in these four chapters that deal with the subject of unity. So let's look at them. Chapter 1 and verse 27. Chapter 1 and verse 27 says, Only let your conversation or your way of living, your manner of life, your lifestyle, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So that's what Paul's desire was. Whether I come and see you or if I don't get there, I still want to hear reports that describe your assembly like this. This is an assembly of Christians that are standing fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then the second passage that deals with the subject of unity is in chapter 2. We read it already. Uh, he says in verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So you have these expressions, descriptive expressions. In chapter 1, we have them standing fast. We have them striving together. In chapter 2, we have them of one accord. And then the third passage dealing with the subject of unity is in chapter 4, where it's not a general exhortation to the entire assembly. It's a specific pleading to two sisters. I beseech, verse 2 of chapter 4, I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Unity is something which God highly values. Unity is something, at least unity as God would have it, is something the devil absolutely hates. And therefore, from the very beginning, the devil's purpose has always been to divide what God wanted to have united. And so right at the very beginning of human history, he successfully was able to drive a wedge at the greatest division possible between God and man. And most of you have likely heard that very, very well-known poem. When sin first raised its ugly head, it caused a widening span between the man who walked with God and God who made the man. And the story of the gospel goes on through that poem. That's the first great act of division that the devil was able to accomplish. He attempted to drive a wedge between the man and the woman. God had said it's not good for a man to be alone, and he made a help suitable for him. And at the very beginning of our Bibles, we see how marriage was put in place by God, intended to be a permanent union, mirroring the relationship with Christ in the church or modeling it, what did the devil do? The very first words almost that Adam speaks to the Lord, the woman thou gavest me. And right away, you see the beginning of a wedge coming in. And tragically, you see down through the years how successfully the devil divides marriages. He seeks to divide assemblies. Brother Sandy has already said he has been discouragingly effective at dividing assemblies. And the vast majority of division, the vast majority, I would echo what Sandy says, comes through personal clashes, family feuds, fleshly outbursts. And dear brother or sister today, you or me, we're not above being the source of division. But as we look at the letter to the Philippians, not only is there this appeal to unity, uh, not only is there a, an emphasis that it's, it's got to be for the sake of the gospel, that's what you have in chapter 1. 
striving together for the faith of the gospel, effectiveness in spiritual service, effectiveness in assembly testimony requires unity. But I want you to notice something. Unity, while a very fragile thing, unity requires like-mindedness. Now, I want to be careful what I say here. I don't want anyone misunderstanding me. When I use the term like-mindedness, I want to show you from Philippians, I'm using it in the way this letter uses it in the Bible. Like-mindedness doesn't mean that everyone has to agree with me. And like-mindedness doesn't necessarily mean that we have to agree on every detail. Now, it's quite possible for us, and it should actually be something we strive for, for us to maintain unity in essential things and allow things that are not essential to never divide us. So if somebody wants to attend meetings with certain type of clothing and I want to attend meetings with a different type of clothing, please don't allow that to come in and be a source of division. If somebody thinks we should use the old version believer's hymn book because that's what our foreparents used and heretics like Midland Park use a new version of the believer's hymn book, don't let something like that divide us. So there's many issues like that where a matter of preference, a matter just of precedent, the way that we've done things, those should not be issues that we allow to divide us. And it's very dangerous if we do. But it's also very dangerous if we simply take the buzzwords that are very popular today and claim that unity results from just setting aside our differences and uniting. Now that might sound appealing, and if our differences are that I think I should wear a tie and somebody here today doesn't think they should wear a tie, then by all means set aside those differences and unite. But if setting aside our differences for the sake of the gospel means that we do not agree on scriptural truth, then I believe the letter of the Philippians shows us we can't be unified. Truth unites. But by its very def definition, when truth unites, it unites those that believe that truth and are like-minded. So I want you to look with me at these passages. Philippians chapter 1, at the end in verse 27 where we read, it doesn't just say that you will stand fast in one spirit, that you will strive together. In between those two expressions, you have this little expression, that you'll stand fast in one spirit with one mind. Now that word literally means thinking the same thing. When you come to chapter 2 at the beginning, in verse 2, fulfill ye my joy, being of one accord. What else does the verse say? Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. That means thinking the same thing. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. What unites an assembly of believers? First of all, absolutely, absolutely is life. We, we need divine life. That's what brings us into relationship with God and brings us into relationship with one another. But it is also a common understanding of the truth of the Word of God. It is a tragedy that there are multitudes of different Christian churches. I don't glory in that. I don't even, I'm not complacent about that. But I accept that as a historical reality. Some of the differences may be petty. Many of the differences are not petty. Many of the differences are because people believe different things about the Bible. They read the same Bible but they believe different things. So I would just issue an appeal today to everyone who's here, young or old or middle-aged. There is tremendous access today through the information age, through the internet, tremendous access today to all types of views of what the Bible teaches. And what is out there begins to filter its way in here. And as people are exposed to various ways of viewing a passage and various ways of understanding truth, it will inevitably 
begin to express itself in disagreement about the truth of Scripture. Now, I am not talking about petty arguments of things of little consequence. I'm talking about the truth of Scripture as it's revealed to us. Assembly unity, according to Philippians, is based on thinking the same thing. Not in a narrow-minded, bigoted way, but in an open-minded. Now, I use that term open-minded, not in terms of open to anything. Open to the truth of the Word of God. An open-minded sense of thinking the same thing. Be very, very careful. And may God preserve any of us from being a conduit through which we introduce a line of thinking or our own thinking, whether that is based on traditionalism or based on revolutionary thinking, introducing into something our own thinking that upsets and ultimately destroys the unity of a local assembly. Because God values it. God cherishes it. Places a high value on it. It's never His intention that His people will be divided. But I want you to see from these passages that unity in Philippians is based on being like-minded. Now, the second thing I want to touch on in my remaining time in this message is the subject of joy and rejoicing. It runs right through the epistle. And I would suggest for any not that familiar with the epistle, print it out, or if you get an electronic copy that you can highlight, go through and highlight every time you read the word joy, every time you read the word rejoicing. And then ask yourself, uh, as you read those passages, what do we learn from them? So I'm just going to point out quickly to you before my time runs out, some of the times that we read about Paul's joy and Paul's rejoicing. You on your own time can go through and look at the believer's joy and rejoicing. They are told to rejoice by Paul. But let's look at some of the ones where we see Paul rejoicing. First of all, chapter 1 and verse 3. Now again, this overlaps with some of what Sandy said. This great apostle is in prison. His circumstances were bleak. He's suffering. People are rising up all around him, speaking against him. But listen to what he says. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I, when I was studying this passage a little, I asked myself, is my prayer life marked by joy. Joy is independent of circumstances. Paul's circumstances were bleak. And yet he says, when I pray, in every prayer of mine for you, I thank God for every remembrance of you, and I pray for you with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, when I searched my own heart, I had to acknowledge a lot of my prayer life is not marked by joy. And then I saw another little key here. We'll see it again in chapter 4. Maybe one of the reasons my prayer life is not marked enough by joy is because my prayer life is not marked enough by thankfulness. Paul found reason to give thanks. The specific reason he had to give thanks was the fellowship of these believers in Philippi from the first day till now. It got me thinking to my own life. I started thinking back of believers, if I trace the hand of God working in my life, and I can only make it personal, you do the same in your life. But as I think back, all of us have a unique set of circumstances. I was born in Trinidad, my parents were missionaries. I came to live in Canada when I was nine to go to school. My sister and I lived with my aunt and uncle. I was taken to meetings at Brackendale Gospel Hall where they were in fellowship, and I was saved when I was ten. And the man who was preaching in a series of meetings when I was saved was sitting by my bedside that when I trusted Christ was Mr. Jack Noble. His widow is 95 years old, still living in Guelph, Ontario. And as I started thinking over that, I thanked God for Jack Noble. You know, it might be trendy to throw a lot of old preachers uh, in the trash heap. Like, you know, although I'm not sure God was ever in that model. These itinerant preachers traveled around. Be very, very careful of becoming bitter and jaded and opinionated about the work of God. Mr. Jack Noble, he was a failing man like all men are, but he was a man who preached the gospel with zeal and joy and passion. And God used him as an instrument to save me. I thought of where I grew up in that home with my aunt who loved me and cared for me as if we were her own children. My parents who were serving the Lord in Trinidad, a tremendous sacrifice that I haven't even begun to understand the sacrifices they made, but they left a spiritual heritage for me. I thought of the overseers in the assembly that I grew up in. 
and how they invested in me. I thought of my wobbles, pretty serious spiritual wobbles through the last year of high school and university and different ones the Lord used at that time who took an interest in me and he used them for my blessing. I thought of my wife who was stuck faithfully with me for over 30, I can't even think of how many now, I'll get in trouble, 34 years I think it is, or 35, somewhere in there. She's stuck with me. And as I began to think of those that the Lord has used to further his work in my life, I can bow my heart and I can give thanks. And I can do it with joy. I'll just give you one little anecdote here. I was over in Vister a number of years back now speaking at a conference there. And after the meeting ended, there was a little lady. I'm going to run out of time here, so you'll have to trace the joy yourself. But there was this little lady. She was maybe no more than, she seemed about four feet high. Maybe she was four foot six. But she was just this little polite English woman. She came to me at the back of the hall at the end of the meeting. And she said to me, are you the Andrew Usher? And I thought, maybe there's a serial killer in England called Andrew Usher or something I've never heard of. I don't know. I didn't know how to answer. I said, well, I'm Andrew Usher. And she said, oh. She pulled out of her Bible, a well-worn little Bible. She pulled out of her Bible a little black and white wrinkly photograph of my mom and my dad, my brother and my sister and me. That photograph was taken in 1972 in Northern Ireland, the only time I ever really lived in Northern Ireland for a year when mom and dad were in furlough. And dad, as many missionary families did, would take these dorky looking pictures of them and their kids and take them around to all these halls and it's super embarrassing. Well, this lady was holding this picture and she said, I got this picture at a missionary meeting that Danny Usher spoke at. And she said, all through the years, I have prayed for this family and I've prayed for you by name. And she said, I never ever thought I would meet the people in this picture. And I looked at that little lady. I could have folded her up, put her in my pocket, and took her home. I thought, here's a woman, never met me. My mind went back over 40 years, saved when I was 10. 40 years of a journey of life, ups and downs and ins and outs. And a little lady I had never met was mentioning my name at a throne of grace praying that the Lord would bless me. We have every reason to have joy when we pray. Our prayers don't have to be defeatist. Our prayers don't have to be desperate, complaining to the Lord about how bad everything is. When we come to chapter 4, we'll find that in everything, we're to give thanks. Now, sorry, that's, that's 1 Thessalonians. When we come to chapter 4, we're going to find this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything... By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So the first time we find joy here from the Apostle Paul is joy in his prayer life. Come down to verse 18. Verse 18 of chapter 1. Paul has just described in these previous verses that he's in prison. Other people now are much bolder to preach the gospel. Most of them, possibly, he doesn't say most, but some of them are doing it for very good reasons. But some of them are doing it for uh, bad reasons. Verse 15, out of envy and strife. Some of them are preaching out of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to his bonds. But listen to what he says. He says, verse 18, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice. Paul says Christ is being preached. And he says, I'm not ignorant. I'm not naive. I don't have my head stuck in the sand. I'm aware I'm aware that there's people out there that don't like me. I'm aware that there's people out there that are actually working against me. Their motives might be wrong, but they are preaching Christ. And to the extent that Christ is being preached, I will rejoice. How do we do with that? You know, maybe there's avenues of service where the Lord has used you within an assembly or among assemblies. And then for circumstances that you feel are beyond your control, those opportunities for service begin to dry up. And maybe you're misunderstood. And maybe you're judged unfairly. And maybe there's people who have said things that are unkind. And maybe there's people who are trampling on work that you did. And there's people who are taking over and taking credit for it. How do you respond? Again, as Brother Sandy said, we can respond by crawling back in and licking our wounds and feeling sorry for ourselves and nursing the injustice. Or we can take the example of Paul and say, Christ is being preached. 
And if some of those wounds remain in the past, let them stay in the past. And if some of those people don't deserve to get away with it, that's not your axe to grind or mine. Leave it. Leave it. It'll sour your own soul, and bitterness will eat like a cancer and ruin your usefulness for God. So choose joy. I don't mean in an empty, shallow sense. I mean in a legitimate sense, like Paul. Rejoice that the work of God is still going on. Sandy said another very good thing, which is, a lot of the work of God was done before I was born. Now, to some of you, that may seem astounding in your case. It's hard to imagine that the work of God actually was going on before you came along, isn't it? But it was. And if the Lord doesn't return, it'll continue to go on after you're gone. And after I'm gone, it's His work. And He's more than capable of raising His resources, and He's more than capable of furthering His purposes. So if we see His purposes moving forward, then like Paul, let us rejoice. Now the final one I'll say about Paul, and then I will sit down, is uh, verse 10 of chapter 4. We'll skip over a few. You can go through them on your own. But verse 10 of chapter 4. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Paul rejoiced greatly here because he received a gift, financial support from the Christians in Philippi. Chapter 1, he says that he was thankful for their fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now. And in chapter 4, he fills in the details and says, I rejoiced greatly that now at the last your care for me has flourished again. Not very many times will you hear from a conference platform an exhortation to give your money to support the Lord's work. And I know that one of the reasons, and I respect that one of the reasons for that is many of the men who speak from a platform like this do not have secular employment and they rely. They rely on the Lord for their support, but the means the Lord uses to support them is by burdening the hearts of Christians like you and me to give of our financial resources to support those involved in the Lord's work. I have a job. I work. Therefore, I'm not saying I'm above. I'm not saying that in a proud sense at all. I'm just saying that I feel it's important to stress the grace and the privilege of giving. It isn't just the amount of money, although the money certainly helps. It's the expression of support. My parents were missionaries, and with this I'll close. My parents were missionaries in Trinidad. Back in the days before there was direct deposit and electronic transfer and everything else. And I can tell you that the most exciting moment of every day in Trinidad was when the mailman came. Because the mailman rode a bicycle and he would ride down the street where our house was. And I used to sit out on the front porch uh, if it wasn't a school day. And I could see the mailman coming down on his bike. And if he stopped at our mailbox and something went in, it was my job as a little boy. When we were there on the summer holidays, I would run out, I would grab it, and I would take it into my dad. And I wasn't wise enough or old enough to understand it all, but I knew sometimes... Sometimes there was something in the mail that we would all pile in the car and head into town and we would get a little treat. Now, I'm not trying to pull sentimentally at heartstrings. But even in COVID times, there are servants of the Lord, young families, mothers, fathers with children, many of them serving the Lord in tough circumstances. They are worthy of our support. And I would just encourage you to use your financial resources to support those involved in the work of the Lord. They don't have slick marketing campaigns. They're not sending around letters asking for support. But there are many of them who are urgently in need of your support and fellowship in the gospel. And the impact you could have on them is the impact these Christians in Philippi had on Paul. He rejoiced greatly that now at the last their care for him had flourished again. Now I'm out of time. We'll leave the rest of the time for Brother Joseph. Lord willing, this afternoon we'll look at the theme of a healthy mind for a believer from this letter to the Philippians.